and welcome to Conversations With. I'm Courtney. And I'm Keith. And we are the clinical team here at Burton's Academy. With our combined passion for monitoring and ventilation, we're here to rewind and remind you on the foundations and principles used to form the knowledge and understanding in everyday anaesthesia. Well, hello and welcome to our latest podcast. This is a Conversations with Courtney, where myself, Keith Simpson, is talking to Courtney Scales about the subject of hypothermia. Uh, I'm going to start off by asking uh, Courtney to define hypothermia, just so we have a, a grounding for uh, the subject matter that we're talking about. So, uh, Courtney, over to you. Definition of hypothermia. <laughs> so, the normal temperature in our cats and dogs, uh, that varies between whatever kind of literature or whatever textbook you've got open. But we have been able to define hypothermia in three different categories. We have slight, moderate, or severe hypothermia. And slight is the really common um, stage of hypothermia that we see. So that is when the temperature is between 36.5 and 38.4 degrees. So actually, if we're used to calling our cats and dogs normothermic between sort of 38 to 39 degrees, um, calling them slightly hypothermic at 38 to 38.4 degrees does seem quite dramatic. Um, And then we have moderate hypothermia, which is where the patient's temperature is between 34 degrees and 36.5, or really severely hypothermic, which is when the patient's temperature is below 34 degrees. So like I said, when we talk about the slight hypothermic patient being between 36 and a half to 38.4 degrees, we think, oh, that's really unreasonable. There's no way they can be hypothermic. So instead, if you think about your patient becoming hypothermic once their temperature decreases one degree from their baseline temperature, and this is the temperature typically that you would take prior to pre-med because they do start to cool down after we have pre-medicated them. Um, So yeah, that's what we kind of define our hypothermia as slight, moderate or severe, but really, if we just start to call them hypothermic when their temperature changes one degree from their baseline temperature. OK, and one degree doesn't sound very much, but I guess in the scheme of things, in an animal that closely thermoregulates, dropping a one degree centigrade has some sort of implications as well, which I'm sure you're going to cover as well. Um, but OK, well, let's keep it simple. Let's keep it straightforward at the moment. Um, we've got to take this temperature. So. Does it matter where we take it from? Does it matter how we take it? Presumably, my gut feeling would be that you take a temperature from from a surface like an ear or take it from a pore. It's going to be different from a rectal or or a deep esophageal. Um, So, you know, where should we be taking that temperature from before we're going to start to make those conclusions about hypothermia? Mm, That's a really good question because the temperature in our body, in our patient's body, in our cats and dogs, it's not the same, you know, their, their toe temperature isn't the same as their core temperature. So what we typically take in practice, because it is the easiest to obtain, whether they're conscious or anaesthetized, is their rectal temperature. And the reported rectal temperatures, these vary by authors by sort of like 0.1 to 0.5 of a degree that are up or down. So they vary, but we typically take a rectal temperature. And then often through our anesthesia, we continue to take the rectal or the esophageal temperature. But It does matter where we take them because the core temperature is really, when we're talking about hypothermia being slight, moderate or severe, that is our core temperature, which is about 0.4 to 0.5 of a degree higher than the rectal temperature in dogs. Um, And that core temperature, that might actually also be about four degrees different to anything that's in the periphery. So, in terms of taking it from their air, unless you're going deep enough in their air, if you have one of those um, thermometers that uh, the infrared, I think they are, and you put it into your patient's air and you take a temperature, sure, that's going to give you some kind of indication on what their body heat is like. But unless you can get really far down and um, look right down at the eardrum, you're unlikely to get a core temperature. You know, we, we often think core being the body, but actually the head where the brain is, as well, that's going to be a nice warm core temperature. So we're typically taking the rectal temperatures because it's the easiest to obtain. Um, Once they're anaesthetized, we do esophageal or we do rectal again, and we're just watching those trends. But actually, when we do talk about core temperatures, it is higher than the rectal temperature, Um, but it can be as as different as four degrees once you start measuring the periphery, um, sort of like between 
we're not really often taking temperatures between the toes, but if you have one of those surface temperature, um, surface thermometers, then perhaps you are going to get quite a lower reading when you're out in the periphery. And that's for a reason. We're trying to, ourselves, our patients, we're trying to keep all of the good bits nice and, and warm and, and working normally. So that's our core. And we use our periphery to vasodilate and vasoconstrict in order to dissipate. If, you know, if we're too hot, then we're going to vasodilate and get rid of heat. And we do that out of our periphery. So that's why the temperature is so different when you're not uh, recording the core temperature because we're using that periphery as a way to control our temperature. So we're either going to vasoconstrict and we're not going to lose any heat out of our pores um, or our limbs. And we're going to vasodilate if our patient or if we're starting to feel quite hot, then we're going to vasodilate so that we can use that as a way to dissipate heat um, because blood tra uh, heat travels really well in the blood and we can lose it just by vasodilating. Which okay. brings us into why pre-meds and everything and anesthesia <laughs> drops the temperature. But there is a difference in um, where we take our temperatures. Yeah. So so I, I think from what you're saying, and, and there's a really valid point, I think, is you've got to have some some sort of baseline sort of levels before you start making judgments. I mean, you know, we, we all know that a cat during anesthesia, we feel its pores, some feel warm, some feel cold. But that's not going to be a basis for making a decision. We really should be looking at either, you know, deep rectal aura or an esophageal measurement. Mm -hmm. um, okay, now that's, I think that's great. So we know what hypothermia is, we know, you know, where we should be taking temperature and why. So we really, we really want to reflect that core temperature. Um, how are we going to do that? I mean, all sorts of things nowadays. So when, you know, when I qualified, it was a glass thermometer. That was it, you know. <laughs> now we're talking about, you know, all sorts of um, electronic methods. You've got infrared sort of um, measurement techniques. Where, you know, are they any better? Is that better than just uh, the old glass thermometer? How, how can we monitor? Can you can you still get glass thermometers or have they you know, been ruled out because of health and safety? Yeah, I still got one in my travel, in my sort of... Uh, do you? Yeah. Case. Yeah, it's probably probably outlawed but yes I, mean, I don't think you can probably buy them no you probably can't no um so well, things have certainly moved on so, uh, yeah um, and well we I... do have yeah we've got nice uh electronic stuff now so that's quite it's quite safe so, yes so um you know in terms of you know what we can monitor how are we going to monitor what, what are the different methods that we can use to actually monitor this temperature that's a great question because regardless of if you have all of the bells and whistles and you've got a multi-parameter or you just have your handheld thermometer, that's probably likely to be digital now. Um, if you have a multi-parameter, then actually you can get a continuous display of your patient's temperature and literally watch by each decimal place of it getting warmer or cooler. So mm -hmm. if you have a multi-parameter, you often will get these esophageal or rectal probes that you can use. So if you are fortunate enough to have a machine where you can plug in two different temperature lines, you can put one down the esophagus and then you can put one up the rectum as well. Just make sure that they're colour coded um, or you've got those thermometer slips over the end if you are going to place it rectally. Um, so you absolutely can you place it esophageal. That's fine. When you open up the patient's mouth, I tend to, um, I take comfort in knowing that there's only two places it can go, and one of the places has an ET tube in it. Um, so you just want to keep feeding your esophageal temperature probe in, um, and you won't feel any resistance. In terms of where you want to measure it, if you go too far into your patient, you'll go into the stomach, and then you will get a lower reading. Um, and because you've kind of tickled that cardiac sphincter, they might be more inclined to reflux or regurg under anesthesia. So I typically, when the patient was um, anesthetized, I would just bend the elbow to 90 degrees and I would feed, I would measure on the outside of the patient the length of the um, esophageal temperature probe from the point of the, you know, the shoulder or the point of the elbow, that's when it's bent. Um, and then I would feed it in only to that point, hoping that I was going to be nice and into the core and not actually so far that I was into the stomach. Um, so if you do have a multi-parameter, a lot of them will have functionalities where you can get a continuous um, temperature reading. Um, if you don't have that, then you just have a little handheld digital thermometer, then you can place that rectally, which is very common. We do that in almost all of our patients. Um, and if you 
have a, a patient that's big enough. So I typically think of a patient that's over about 10 degree, uh, 10 kilograms, sorry. And if I have a flexible thermometer as well, then actually you can insert that into the nose. Um, and it should go in nice and there should be no resistance and it should just uh, go right in. Um, and you can just click that on and you can take a reading every five minutes. Um, but ideally, don't let that lapse past 15 minutes because you do want to be acting on trends. So if the, if the temperature is trending up, perhaps you need to turn off some warming equipment. If it's trending down, perhaps you need to add more warming equipment um, or perhaps change the temperature of the room. Um, there... Like I said before, there are those um, thermometers that you can do infrared thermometers in the airs um, around the air jump, but there is really mixed evidence on how reliable that is. Um, but they may lag behind the true core body temperature unless you're placing it deep enough in. So I tend to personally, as a personal preference, I tend to go instead for the nose, the esophageal probes or the rectal probes or the rectal thermometer. OK, so um, I mean, I, I've not had a lot of experience with the in the ear ones, but my, you know, what I have had experience of has been human ones. Are there actually in the ear ones designed for animals or are we really just using human ones? I believe I've used a product before that was veterinary design. So it did have a bit of a curve to it. So okay. it allowed us to go um, around the different canals of the ear. Um, but still, I couldn't find convincing enough evidence for me to uh, want to go out and replace all of my um, temperature monitoring probes with that one. But uh, you know what? If you don't have anything, I think the important thing when you're monitoring patient's temperature is it is trend based. Um, so even if even if you just had that. And you were able to, if, I mean, hopefully everyone's got a rectal thermometer somewhere, but it is trends based. Yes. But I don't think you could be so bold as to say it is definitely as as close to the rectal temperature or as close to the core temperature. I, I wouldn't be so bold to assume that. No, I, th I would agree with you there. So one of the things that, you know, I talk about things like catalography or whatever, and obviously we, we look at um, what happens when, you know, end tidal CO2 levels wander off. We get very excited about how we're going to deal with them. So <laughs> why, why are we going to get worried? What about, so the temperature, you know, is it a big deal? Do we need to worry about it? Um, you know, why does it, why do we get hypothermia? Um, so what, in a sort of overall view of hypothermia, um, that's sort of blunt question. Why, why mm -hmm. should we bother? Why should we think about hypothermia? What are the consequences of progressive hypothermia you know what it's going to what's it going to do to our patient mm -hmm. i think i enjoy monitoring my patient's temperature and acting on hypothermia because as a vet nurse who's doing a lot of anesthesia i find it is something that i really can control and really help my patient with and i think sometimes people have a bit are a bit blasé about it because our patients wake up and they usually walk out the door at the end of this. If you don't treat your patient's bleeding, for example, or hypotension, and there's blood all over the floor, you know, they might not wake up and walk out the door. So I think we tend to just put hypothermia off to the side and we think, oh, it doesn't really matter. They'll wake up, they'll eventually warm up, and then they'll go home. But actually, it could prolong their recovery, and it has a number of negative impacts, um, negative effects on the body, some of which are quite small, and then some of them can absolutely become life-threatening. Life so Hypothermia in itself can be an anaesthetic, um, so it really does depress that central nervous system. And by doing that, it also not only could you make it perhaps a subjective overdose for your patient's anaesthetic, because every degree change of your patient, that MAC changes with it. Our minimum alveoli concentration changes with it. So you could actually, we've already got hypothermia causing um kind of CNS depression and then you're going what you're doing is then you're making our volatile agent or your isoflurane or sevoflurane you've changed the MAC of that but if you just leave your vaporizer at your normal I don't know 1.3 1.4 actually for a patient that already has CNS depression that's even more of an overdose to them so you're going to start getting um, those dose dependent side effects maybe they'll become a bit hypotensive and maybe they'll become a bit bradycardic and the thing is when we do depress our central nervous system and we do get a really hypothermic patient some of our drugs that we would use to increase the heart rate or to make the blood pressure increase 
they end up not working because you're taking the whole body out of this nice, happy homeostatic state. So you can create um, an incidence where you're subjectively overdosing them with your anesthetic agent. Um, they can become bradycardic. They can become hypotensive. So the vascular tone changes with hypothermia. Um, the cardiac output obviously decreases because so we get lower blood pressure. And another thing that when we are cooler as well and we are hypothermic is our metabolism slows down with that. Um, and we need our meta metabolism working really, really well when we're under anesthesia so that it can metabolize those drugs and get them out of the body so that we can wake up. We don't have this prolonged action of these drugs. So we think about hypothermia just in the um, anesthetic phase going, oh, yeah, keep them nice and warm, let them metabolize their drugs. But like, let's f switch and think of the other side when we've got a really cold patient that's trying to recover. They have this huge prolonged recovery period where they're laying there and potentially maybe they're getting colder or maybe they're laying there past their dinner time and they're becoming hypoglycemic. Um, so there actually is uh, a study and proof to say that our really cold patients, they take longer to extubate. Um, mm. A patient that's taking longer to extubate is a patient that's not going to get out the door as quick. They're getting colder. Like I said, perhaps they've started to shiver. They're using more oxygen when you shiver. Um, and also it's holding us up as anaesthetists and in a busy clinic. We've got these cold patients that we're not actually able to extubate and move on with. Um, so it does slow down that patient's metabolism. Okay. Also, some of this... Oh yes, Sorry, I was going to say that's really interesting. I mean, the, the the effect on the MAC, because what you're basically saying is that as your patient is getting, um, you know, colder on the table and starting to lose body heat, the effect of the anaesthetic you're applying is going to become more and more profound. So depth of anaesthesia is almost going to be self-perpetuating. They're going to get colder, they're going to get deeper, they're going to get colder. It's going to be almost like, as I say, self-perpetuating. So that's, that's significant. And also the effect uh, on the MAC um, I just like to, to clarify, we, we're talking about, mm -hmm. I think you said minimum alveolar uh, concentrations. Um, that's going to, um, that's quite quite significant, isn't it? And I think these things are lost when we think, well, poor animal's getting cold, it's going to be shivering and it's going to have a prolonged recovery. But understandably, from what you're saying, if you're affecting things like the, the way an, an anaesthetic has an effect on a patient just through hypothermia, that's quite profound. Um, so I interrupted you. So, so no, so no, it is, it is though, and we we think, oh, they're cold, they'll, they'll wake up. But even just thinking back to our minimum alveolar concentration, it's every single degree that that patient's temperature goes down, the MAC decreases by five percent. So, um, for example, if we have a Jack Russell Terrier that's um, been anaesthetized with isoflurane and oxygen, isoflurane has a MAC in dogs of one point three. So this is typically you know, what is in the in the um in the alveoli at the end of the breath. And we liken that to being if that's what's in the alveoli at the end of the breath, that must be what's in the blood, therefore that must be what's in the brain to keep them anesthetized. So if we take our Jack Russell, um his temperature was 38.2 degrees at the beginning of anesthesia, and we think, oh lovely, he's toasty. Our Mac, our Mac will be 1.3. That's great. But within 30 minutes, suddenly his patient his temperatures dropped from 38.2 down to 37.2. So we've got a one degree temperature drop. Therefore, our MAC has changed from 1.3 down to 1.23. So you can see how literally um, by leaving our vaporizer as is, he's going to become a bit deeper. We might as well have kept exactly. him normothermic yeah. and then turn the vaporizer up. And mm -hmm. then that's our first 30 minutes. And we think, oh, fine, whatever. It's just a, it's just one degree. But now he, he you know, he's eating a tennis ball. They always eat tennis balls. So he's having an X lap. Um, things get a bit messy. There's a bit of abdominal lavage and we've used some cold saline. So now as temperature is even lower, it's down to 35.2 degrees. So actually, by when we keep taking that 5% off, 5% off, 5%, now we've got a MAC that's 1.1%. And if we've just been really busy running around, um, not monitoring temperatures or actioning that temperature change, we've we've gone from a MAC of 1.3 down to a cold dog that's got a MAC of 1.1. So that's when you start to say, oh, the MAC only changes by 5%, five, 5%, and you think the MAC is such a small number, it really does accumulate. So now we've got a dog that only got a MAC of 1.1. So they do get that overdose. Um, and I, I 
notice that straight away when I'm monitoring an anesthetic. If I think I've got a cold dog and I'm just not winning with trying to keep them warm, I start to turn down that vaporizer. I know it's going to be a subjective overdose to that patient, as well as I'm running around trying to heat them and turn the theater, um, the theater heat up. Um, but it definitely does have a quite a profound effect on their anesthetic depth, as well as if it gets more and more severe, it actually does cause clotting problems in our patients. So they're under anesthesia, they're having these big procedures done, and now they're not able to clot so well. Um, so now they're bleeding more. Um, and actually, something that as anaesthetists, we tend not to be so worried about is wound breakdown. But our surgeons, I think our vets, I think nurses sometimes get a bit of a reputation, like, oh, it's really cold, I'm turning in the I'm turning the temperature up in the theatre and the surgeons go, oh, no, it's too hot or faint or whatnot. Um, actually, it could affect the patient's wound healing, and I bet they don't want that on their um, on their plate as wound breakdown, yeah. but it does. It, it does, and very, very severe cases. When you have a patient's temperature that is less than 30 degrees, you will start to get cardiac arrhythmias, and I personally have seen this once in a very, very horrible, horrible case where I had a cat that was just over 29 degrees. Um, and I, I think I left the theatre crying because I didn't know what more to do. I literally was doing everything I could, but this cat did start to develop arrhythmias and we threw every kind of drug at it. Um, and, you know, it didn't die, but I almost did. Um, yeah. So you can go from these little minor minor side effects and then you can go to massively life-threatening side effects. But just our minor side effects, that should be enough um, of a worry for us as an anaesthetist at the We've got this patient that's bradycardic. They are developing a hypotension. Um, there's no point filling them up with fluid and giving them fluid boluses um, because what they really need to do is they just need to become a bit warmer. Um, and we can't give them these drugs to improve that blood pressure if we're very cold because um, our receptors just also go, oh, no, thank you. Um, and we do get the subject of overdose of anesthetic. And we are going to have a prolonged effect of our sedation drugs into recovery. So I think those are some of the immediate yet minor ones that we should be conscious of. Yeah. So I guess then we're looking at also when we start to think about how these patients are going to respond on anaesthetic, we're going to have some that are going to be, you know, pretty robust. They're going to be almost um, resistant to temperature changes. We're going to have other patients which are going to be, shall we call, fragile, which are going to be greater risk, you know, of, of hypothermia. I mean, can you identify those patients? Are there things that, that will signal whether that patient's going to be a high risk for hypothermia or, or low risk? Yeah, there's definitely some patients that we know will become more hypothermic than others or are, at, like you said, are at more at risk of becoming hypothermic. And that is our patients that are quite small. So that could be a cat, that could be a small dog, it could be small mammals, so rabbits and rats. And that is generally due to their body um, to surface area ratio. So they have this tiny little wee body, but the surface area around them is, is very different compared to a, a Labrador um, for example. So our very small patients, they're going to get colder a lot quicker. They've got way more surface area to their body mass to get to lose their heat out of. Um, then we have our patients that uh, have a change in metabolism. So it's a bit slower. And that is our neonatal patients and our geriatric patients. They've just got the slower metabolism. They might not be able to generate so much heat anymore um, or um, or, yeah, generate heat or just react differently to whenever we subject them to different heat temperatures. Um, and I think another thing we should be conscious of is patients that have liver disease. So metabolism, that liver metabolism, that generates heat. Therefore, if we have liver disease, they might actually be prone to hypothermia because they have an organ that is not functioning correctly. Um, and we also do see these patients that are have reduced muscle mass they get quite cold as well, or reduce okay. body fat as well. So our skinny, old, crispy cats that are coming in for their dentals, they don't have a lot of muscle mass. They don't have a lot of body fat. They're also old and geriatric, so um, their metabolism's a bit slower. So they're going to be very susceptible to hypothermia. Okay. So I think if, you know, if we look at these animals, we can identify the ones that are going to be at greater risk than others. Um, I think we need to maybe maybe you can explain to me the the sort of the science behind heat loss. I mean, there's got to be some 
those mechanisms which are get, getting sort of invoked that, that lead to heat loss, what, what, what are they? And then thereby, what can we do about them? Maybe mm-hmm. you can just, could you talk me through that? Sure. So thermoregulation, this is a very complex um, procedure within the body. Um, and when I use the term thermoregulation, that is where an animal, um, whether it's us as mammals or it's our cats and dogs as mammals, this is where we can keep our temperature within a certain range when the environmental temperature around us changes. Um, so that's what thermoregulation is. And we do that with, um, like I mentioned before, distributing heat out to our periphery and we can lose heat that way, but then we can also shut off access to our periphery with vasoconstriction and we can stop losing heat that way. So we have something called the interthreshold range and this is a very, very narrow range where there are um, no uh, thermoregulatory responses that aren't triggered. So we have our thermo um, receptor centre in our brain um, and what we have this, so basically we have this threshold of about 0.2 of a degree plus or minus our set point temperature. And as long as our body stays within that very narrow range of 0.4 of a degree, nothing happens and we just go about our day. Our patient's nice and happy um, and there's no no response to temperature change because that's where we want to be. However, once you start to go above or below that, you become a bit hyperthermic or a bit hypothermic, it sends a message to our brain that actually what we need to do now is we need to start trying to preserve our body temperature. And this could be behavioural or this could be physiological. So a behavioural way of trying to increase your body temperature is seeking out the sun. Um, our cats might find a nice sunny patch to lay in, but they're unable to do this under anaesthesia. So these behavioural responses where you might go and find a sunny patch to lay in or you might go and um, lay on the cool tiles, they can't do this under anaesthesia um, because they're they're anaesthetised. They can't go and seek that. Um, And then another way that we monitor and we try and change our temperature is physiologically. So this could be goosebumps. This could be shivering. This could be vasodilation, getting blood to the periphery um, or this could be vasoconstriction stopping blood getting to the periphery to to be released and so anesthesia changes this whole um, inter threshold range so normally if we have about point two plus or minus our temperature so a range of 0.4 under anesthesia this actually changes to about two degrees so point um, so sorry two degrees lower and two degrees above we start to think under anesthesia that we're in our thermo um, we're in our into threshold range. So we try, we don't, we're like, oh, we're fine. We don't need to vasodilate or vasoconstrict until our temperature changes massively across a range of, instead of 0.4, it's now four degrees as well. So not only are we telling our brains not to worry about how cold we're getting, the colder we get, then our brain becomes unable to respond to that. Mm-hmm. So it's a really complex um, constant sensing and processing, and it actually uses the same fibers as what pain travels on as well. Um, but this is all going up to the thermocenter in the ba- in the brain, um, and it's thinking, oh gosh, I'm actually I'm quite warm now. I'm going to vasodilate, and I might try and find some cool tiles if I was conscious. Um, or gosh, I'm actually starting to feel quite cold. I'm going to vasoconstrict and stop any heat loss out my periphery. So, thermoregulation itself is quite complex, and We do actually lose heat in in quite a few different ways. There's four different ways that we can lose heat, and that's radiation, convection, conduction, and evaporation. So radiation's very nice and simple. It's just heat is just moving from our bodies, traveling away in in waves, um, just to the cooler environment that's around us. So when we walk into a cold room, um, we're already going to be losing heat to this colder room. And then uh, in convection heat loss, that's a nice warm, you know, you know when someone's close to you because you can feel their warmth. But if you have a cold operating room with air that's constantly moving past the patient, we will lose heat that way as well. It's almost blown off the body. Um, and conduction heat loss, that is where our patients could very much be laying on a cool table, an operating table, um, or a cool kennel floor, and they're actually losing their body heat to that object. And then we have evaporation heat loss as well, which is generally what comes from the respiratory tract. Our breath is nice and warm, um, but when we are under anesthesia with these cool, cold, dry gases, that does have an effect on um, our patient's temperature. So, 
although it's a very complex um, process thermoregulation, when you're conscious and healthy, you're able to regulate it very well within this very fine range. But under anesthesia, everything goes out the window. And then we put them in these really cold environments with really cold um, operating theatres, cold tables and cold surgical um, prep solution, for example. Yeah. So I guess evaporative loss, again, will also occur when you just um, shave that abdomen for the bitch bay and you're whacking the little, you know, poverty and iodine and then spirit over it. That's going to massively contribute to evaporative uh, heat loss, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And and even once we've started surgery and we've got that body cavity open, we're getting the nice, warm moisture as well evaporating out of our patients. Mm. But the biggest concern for us is the radiation and convection heat loss. So losing it to the surroundings, our patient's surroundings. And that actually is huge. It contributes to 80% of the patient's heat loss. Um, so of the four types of heat loss, the radiation, convection, conduction, evaporation, it's radiation and convection. So the environment around our patient, that is that's where we lose a lot of the heat. So fur, it's a natural insulator. We talk a lot about fur and insulation when we talk about ECGs. <laughs> that stops us getting our nice signal and interference. But actually, it also plays a role in um, keeping that patient warm. So it's an insulator. And then we go and clip them and we, we remove it. Um, and then we go out at insult to injuries and we, we cover them in this fluid. And especially with alcohol as well as a final prep, that does evaporate. That pulls fluid off, uh, that pulls heat off with them, sorry. Right. So um, there's obviously, so I'm pleased to hear what you say that 80% there is there is is um, uh, convection and radiation. I think what you said, is that correct? Yes. Radiation convection is 80% yeah, so of our loss. Two main ones. That's a phenomenal amount, isn't it? And that, that's a big contribution. So um, that begs me, or begs the question for me then is, is all right, so we understand they're going to lose this heat loss. Two questions spring to mind. One is, how are we going to offset that? My gut feeling is you're going to say we're going to, we're going to warm them somehow. My second, <laughs> question going to, my second question is going to be, do we warm them before they get cold or are we going to be reactive and warm them as they're getting cold or once they get cold? I mean, how, how should we approach this? Um, maybe you could just sort of expand on those a couple of bit. Sure. So I think before we start to discuss how we should keep them warm and when we should start warming them, I think it's really important that we understand the way in which heat is lost. Because I've been talking a lot about vasoconstriction, vasodilation, evaporation, um, radiation, all of those things. But there's actually three phases to heat loss. Um, and in phase one, so, so I think in order to appreciate how we should um, warm our patients, we should understand, especially phase one. So phase one is where within the first 30 minutes and the first 30 to 60 minutes of anesthesia, uh, if we have a if we have a line graph, it plummets. It just is like cliff edge plummets. And phase one, within the first 30 to 60 minutes of anesthesia, the body heat that was really nice in that core and being protected by our conscious brain controlling vasoconstriction, vasodilation, that's gone. We lose we lose that ability to um, vasoconstrict, vasodilate. So what happens is that all of that really nice warm body heat from the core, it just distributes straight to the periphery. Um, and we end up with this ginormous large drop in patient temperature. And I'm talking, it can drop by um, one to two degrees within the first 30 to 60 minutes. So this is a really, really critical period to provide patient warming, which I'll explain in just a second. And then in our second phase, this is where that linear drop, it, it slows down a little bit and that is because the core temperature is almost matching um, the peripheral temperature and we have an instance where the heat loss at the um, the heat that the body's generating is equal to the heat loss for example um, and then that then we get right down into a thermal plateau where our patients generally we all know what it's like we can watch the patient's temperature drop it can go 38 37 36 gets to 35 and then we think oh it just seems to be staying at 35 unless we massively insult them with cold flush or something like that so in our three phases our phase one that happens within 30 to 60 minutes and that is usually due to redistribution of heat from the body's core right out to the periphery and it's this huge drop in our second phase this is just where we get that really slow linear drop in core temperature um and then we have our, our thermal, what we call our thermal plateau, which is our phase three, where 
the heat that the body is generating is actually the same as what the heat that they're losing is. So kind of equals production. So that brings us around to when should we actually be warming our patients? And <laughs> you're right from the start. The moment we touch our patients with any kind of an acidic drug like acepromazine, that's going to vasodilate. That's going to make them go from this happy, bouncy dog to this, you know, pile of fluff on the floor. And after we start pre-medicating and slowing down um, the the brain's way of reacting to temperature change, that's when we really should be starting to heat them. So as soon as we pre-medicate our patients, pop a heat blanket in them, a heat pad like a hot dog. Um, and then throw a blanket over the top of them as well, because if we think back to our heat losses, they can lose heat through the floor via conduction. So that's where our nice heat pad is mm-hmm. going to help. And then that heat pad is also going to help um, bounce heat back up into them. And then we've created this big hot dome by throwing a blanket over the top of them. So from the moment they're pre-medicated, I would be warming our patient. And also, if we think about in phase one, where we start to rapidly lose heat from our periphery, Well, if we've heated them and we've made them a little bit hotter, it seems less dramatic. So, for example, if our dog was 38 degrees at the time of pre-med and then we get them out to anaesthetize them and now they're going very quickly within that first hour to 37 degrees, you know, that's quite a dramatic drop. But if we say preheated our patient after pre-med and we got them up to 30 8.8 8.8 degrees, and then we anesthetize them in that first 30 to 60 minutes, they lose that body heat very quickly. Then they're only down to 37.8, 37.9. So that shift is much more, is, sorry, is less dramatic if we can just pre warm our patients just from the get go. Okay. And, and then, you know, that's kind of the, the, the pre med um, stage or the early stages. What about the, you know, the, the prolonged stages during anesthesia? What can we do for them then? So in order to keep them warm throughout the anesthesia, we have to think of warming being, you know, we can warm our patients in two different ways. So we can do active warming and we can do passive warming. And I remember someone telling me these terms and being like, you can actively warm them or passively warm them. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. And I haven't actually stopped to think about what those actually mean or what products they actually involve. So when we talk, we'll start with the easy one, we talk about passive warming. So passive warming is purely, if you have a patient anesthetized and you throw a blanket over them, you're not going to be warming them. All you're going to be doing is stopping or slowing down the rate in which they cool. So passive warming is purely around retaining the patient's current temperature to re- try and reduce the further temperature loss. Um, so we can use my favorite thing. Everyone always hears me talk about baby socks. Um, so it's just covering them up with things to try and stop losing, uh, stop any heat being lost or trying to insulate them. So we can do that, pop the blanket over them, but we're not going to be warming them with that that fabric fleecy blanket. We're just trying to slow down or maintain the temperature. So we can, passive warming would be blankets. Um, You can use those foil blankets um, from, you can find them in first aid kits, but you can also buy them. So foil blankets are great under anesthesia. I would not put a foil blanket around the patient that's trying to recover purely because the noise is actually quite terrifying for them. Um, Like I said before, you can put baby socks on the extremities. You can bubble wrap those extremities. And it's not just about losing heat out the little pores. It's also, if you think about going back to when I mentioned small patients that have this small body mass to surface area ratio, that's exactly what the pores are and that's exactly what the tail is. So these are these have a huge surface area for a relatively small amount of muscle or, or body to the patient. So wrap them with baby socks, put bubble wrap around them. Um, I often also put bubble wrap around the head as well. So that's that's an area where they lose quite a lot of heat. If it's not the core, trust me, I'm wrapping it. I'm putting mm-hmm. things around tails, around the pores, um, around the head as well. And actually for every um, layer that you add to your patient, you can re- reduce heat loss by 30 to 50% just by how many layers. So for example, if you have put one blanket around your patient, you might reduce their heat loss by 30%. If you then put a blanket and then a drape around the patient, it could be reducing heat loss up to 50%. So every time you add a layer to your patient, as long as it's not a very heavy weight on your patient, you can actually um, reduce their heat loss more and more. So if you've got baby socks, then you've got a blanket, then you've got the drapes. Um, Think of how how fantastic your passive warming technique is. 
And then that brings us on to what active warming is. So active warming is when we apply something external to the patient to warm them up. So we've got passive, which is stopping them losing weight or maintaining. And then you've got active, which is trying to warm them up. So this could be um, electrical plug-in blankets. It could be these warm water blankets. And it could also be the forced warm air blankets. Um, just a note on the forced warm air blankets. So they could be your hot dogs, for example, or your cocoon, depending on what brand you have. Please don't forget to lubricate their eyes <laughs> because they are under this big hot um, tent effectively and this hot air, warm airflow constantly going past your eyes can definitely dry them out. Um, if you are going to use a electrical blanket like a hot dog or a, a, well, your hot dog can go over the patient as well, but generally you're going to get in the way of the surgeon operating. So if you are going to put them onto the patient, just place them on the table before you operate. I know it sounds like a given just so that you don't have to try and shimmy one in um, partway through the surger uh, surgery. And if your patient, you notice a trend up in patient temperature, you're actually fortunate enough just to be able to flick it off at the wall and stop any power going to that blanket so that they're not going to get too hot. Um, these bigger dogs are really, oh, what could we say, Newfoundland, Great Danes, these very, very big dogs, they might actually benefit from having the electrical blanket over the top of them uh, versus underneath them, just because their body weight two reasons really their body weight is so heavy that they could get pressure sores or pressure burns um, but actually where they are laying on their bony points or their big back they could actually be pushing all of the blood from their capillary and therefore there's nothing that's actually going to try and pick that heat up and take it around the body so in our very heavy patients it might be more beneficial to throw a blanket over the top of them than putting a warming blanket underneath them um, another type of active warming technique as well you can use um intravenous fluid warmers uh, they will warm the fluids usually up to about 38 degrees uh, 38 to 39 degrees um, not too hot that it's going to cause damage to the vessels um, and the important thing if you are going to use fluid warmers for example is just to not have them they come with this very convenient strap that fix, fits onto the drip pump um, but actually by the time it goes through that and then goes a meter and a half down the line into our patient it's probably back to room temperature so if you are going to be using intravenous fluid warmers just have them quite close to your patient's IV port um, and IV connection so that it's nice and warm by the time it gets into the patient. I wouldn't recommend the hot hands um, like wrapping fluids around the hot hands or putting hot hands or wheat bags around the patient anyway, because the temperature is very variable with those. Um, they might have hot spots and there's nothing worse than if you try and fill up a hot hand, so a gloved hand for really hot water, um, as if it bursts around the patient. It, it could be quite dangerous for our patients. Um, mm. So we should technically... There was a paper that came out um, in 2013 that said if you have a dog that has having a procedure that's lasting longer than 20 minutes, um, we should be using active warming techniques. So considering cats are smaller than, than our dogs, we should probably be using active warming techniques in cats regardless. But definitely in dogs, if you're having a procedure that goes over 20 minutes, start active warming. Even if you anesthetize them at 38 degrees, and you start active warming, then it's you're probably not going to be actively cooking them up to 39 degrees. Um, they're more likely to get cold than they are hot. And you want to kind of act on that trend and you can beat the trend to it, for example. Sure. OK, that, so that's that's really interesting. There's a lot of things that we can be doing. I want to just go back to one of the things you said. I think you said, you know, uh, I asked before about this 80 percent loss is through the, the uh, radiation and um uh, confection. So, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you know we're, we're taught or we, we're we led to believe is that there's a lot of heat loss through the respiratory tract. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, a there seems to be a a call for you know HMEs. Uh, have, have you gotten any thoughts on the the effect of HMEs? I'm guessing really that if 80% of it is, is not related to that type of evaporative loss, then moderation or control of that is going to have less of an effect. But um, I think a lot of people use HMEs and maybe worth commenting on the efficacy of HMEs and, and how mm -hmm. they might work. Have any thoughts on that? I find HMEs very interesting and I think they do, do make a difference to our patient, but is it in their respiratory loss? Um, obviously, we put our patients onto circle breathing systems as well with the hope that the um, 
heat and moisture will be able to be retained from their breath. So that's kind of the same thing that we're hoping to achieve when we use these heat and moisture exchange devices. So they just fit on the end of the ET tube uh, between the patient and the breathing system. And the idea is that it traps in heat and moisture. But if we only have respiratory tract heat losses, kind of like less than 10%, um, are we actually able to keep our patients warmer with these? It might not be as good as trying to wrap them up with blankets and potentially there is an argument that, yeah, of course, they do provide a bit of warmth to the patient, but I don't think it's enough to warrant um, a dog laying on an operating table with just an HME, for example. And actually what's quite interesting, and I get down proper rabbit holes about HMEs, is that I prefer to use an HME when I'm thinking about the mucosal health of that airway because the anesthetic gases, they are, you know, these cold dry gases that then go and dry out our respiratory mucosa and all of the nice happy cilia that are trying to move mucus back and forth and wave um, back and forth together. Those dry gases, they can really damage the um, respiratory mucosa. So I like the idea of using an HME in that instance, but I wouldn't necessarily rely on one specifically to keep my patient warm. But if I had a very hypothermic patient, I would be trying to do everything I could. Um, but I wouldn't use it as a sole way of keeping my patient warm. And they did actually look into, there is one study where they looked into, um, they had some dogs that they were anesthetizing for an MRI and they looked at using an HME or a pre-medication that causes vasoconstriction. So reducing heat loss out the periphery. And that particular drug was uh, metatomidine or dexmetomidine, but you know, same, same. So we had these patients anesthetized. Some of them had an HME and some of them had um, uh, pre-medication with metatomidine and actually it was the patients that had this pre-medication with metatomidine that kept the um, blood flow in the in the core versus out in the periphery with vasoconstriction they actually were warmer than the patients that had an HME so I think there is somewhere that of course there will be heat and moisture retained but I like to use them more in the instance of looking after the mucosal health and you can argue you can definitely argue that well we have our circle system that's trying to do the exact same thing. The, it keeps the heat and moisture. It keeps that respiratory breath that's already nice and humidified. And then actually the reaction of the soda lime, that creates heat as well. So we're just heat, heat, heat. But what actually um, we should factor in is a lot of people aren't using low flow anesthesia. So you're just pushing that nice hot respiratory or warm respiratory breath straight out into the scavenge. Um, and if you want to use your circle system to maintain heat and moisture, with moisture being the the big thing here is that it takes a wee while for those circle systems to get nice and warm and um, fully humidified with that expiratory breath. So actually, by the time we've got the circle system that's able to retain respiratory moisture, it could be one or two, three hours down the line. So we've already damaged the mucosa by then. <laughs> um, yeah. So I would, and, and same also with HMEs, you can't just whack an HME on for the first five minutes of the procedure. Um, and then, you know, if you've got a really short procedure and then expect them to have um, stay nice and warm or have nice, healthy, moist uh, respiratory mucosa. Um, these all take time to to work. But it is a very low amount of, um, very small amount of loss that we lose out the respiratory tract. But like I said, if I had a patient that was cold, I'd be trying to do everything. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. I think there's a tendency, you know, people take the path of least resistance and they say, well, they think, oh, well, I'll put an HME on that. will that'll take care of my, you know, some of the heat problems or, or, or mm -hmm. heat loss problems. But if, if you know, A, it's only a small fraction and B, it has some other um, effects as well, then you know, maybe it's not the panacea that we think it is. And, and we really should be concentrating on these other methods of, mm -hmm. of uh, reducing heat loss or actively heating these patients. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, this is a a huge topic. We covered, you know, most of it or maybe half of it. But there's such a such an impact from the effect of hypothermia to our patients that uh, I think it's easily overlooked. But um, it, it really is very very important. And um, and we've gone through an awful lot of, of um, information here. Is there anything else you want to add before we just wind up this um, this podcast? Just to keep them warm, <laughs> and we yeah. understand we understand that they're losing body heat from the moment we pre-medicate them. We know it has an impact into the recovery period. We know it's much easier to keep them warm than to try and get them warm. So just cover them with blankets and put baby booties on. And 
baby socks on and just um, don't underestimate the effects it has on our patients. Even though they walk out that door at six o'clock for the discharge appointment, maybe they would have been up and about at half four instead. So um, just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it's not having a tremendous effect on our patients' entire anaesthetic experience. Yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that it has a massive effect on on things like the way they you know, um, manage to get rid of anaesthetic agents from their body, mm-hmm. not just the gaseous ones, but the you know the the injectables because their metabolic rates all affected as well, isn't it? So it's not going to be yeah. a, a singular effect on the um, on the volatile agents. It's going to have an uh, effect overall. Well. That, that's been absolutely amazing. Um, I, I have to thank you so much for, for, for this session. Um, and just to let everybody know that, you know, we'll be back soon for another session and another topic. But for now, thank you very much, Courtney. Thank you. OK, thanks. Bye now. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Don't forget to follow our podcast to stay up to date with the latest episodes. And feel free to share this with your team. If you have any questions or feedback for us or simply want to know more about what you've just heard, please feel free to send us an email at clinical support at burtons.uk.com. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.